So let me finish this section on the analysis of the radon transform by uh, determining the degree of ill-posedness for its inversion. And to do that, I first want to motivate, I lost my cursor. Ah, there it is. Uh, let me motivate fractional Sobolev spaces for a second. Again, this is something that uh, deserves a very thorough treating. And uh, I won't do this. Actually, I will introduce this in five minutes. And uh, I will just take out the idea that I will later need. So if you have anything uh, you want to know about this, um, then uh, look in the relevant PDE, lect um, PDE literature where this is treated in much, much more detail and much more exact. Okay, to fix ideas, uh, let's look at H1 uh, of Rn. So that's uh, the weakly differentiable functions where the functions uh, and the, their derivatives are in L2. And the usual definition of the norm there is that uh, you define the H1 norm squared as the sum of the norm of f and all its derivatives. So it's something like the norm of f squared plus the norm of df over dx1 squared and so on over df dxn squared, all in L2. And uh, in our short writing, this is nothing but the sum over all multi-indices uh, with a degree of alpha smaller or equal to one d to the alpha f in L2. Okay. Now, we have Parseval, so uh, we can also take the Fourier transform of that, and the L2 norm doesn't change. So this is the same as the, Fourier, as the L2 norm of the Fourier transform of the alpha f. And uh, again, using the computation rule that we already exploited, this is exactly the same as xi to the alpha um, Fourier transform of f. Again, in the L2 norm, the I cancels, of course. And uh, now taking the sum apart, this is nothing but um, the um, <laughs> integral over Rn, absolute value of f hat of psi squared times 1 plus psi 1 squared and so on plus psi n squared d psi. And uh, this guy over here, I write as norm of xi squared. So this is nothing but the integral over Rn, f hat of xi, 1 plus norm xi squared d xi. So it's the L2 norm of this one here. Okay. Um, now, um, if we do the same thing for H2, so that's the space of twice um, weakly differentiable functions, then we would add the second derivatives over here. We could do exactly the same thing. And up to one or two constants, uh, what we would get then is uh, the, th the same thing as here, only we wouldn't have 1 plus norm psi squared here, but no, uh, 1 plus norm psi squared squared. So uh, this gives rise to the idea that uh, we could characterize H alpha uh, by, uh, for, at this point for alpha equals one or two, by the uh, space of all functions f, where the H alpha norm of f is smaller than infinity, and the H alpha norm is declared, now that's very obvious from what I, uh, uh, from what I motivated here, is declared as uh, the integral over Rn f hat of xi squared, 1 plus norm xi squared to the alpha d xi. And of course, you need to take the square root to get the, uh, to get the norm. OK, now uh, this absolutely makes sense for alpha, uh, for um, alpha equal, for, um, for the, excuse me, that, that absolutely makes sense for h1 and h2. But uh, it also makes sense for alpha fractional, right? I mean, uh, there's nothing that forces me to uh, 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 that uh, forces me here to choose alpha um, integer. 
I just realized there's a mix up between the uh, alpha over here, which is a multi index, and starting over here, it is uh, just a number, which should be one or two. But uh, I'm not going to change this now. Sorry for the, um, for the error. I will correct this in the PDF. Okay, um, so uh, we allow alpha to be fractional, makes perfect sense. Setting alpha equals to one, uh, to zero, we get L2 back. Alpha equals to one, we get H1 norm back. Alpha equals to two, we get the H2 norm back. Um, we also realize that uh, this is monotonous with respect to alpha. So it becomes bigger when we choose alpha larger. And we also note that H alpha and H alpha prime uh, are not equivalent. The norms are H, norm H alpha and norm H alpha prime are not equivalent for alpha smaller, for example, for alpha smaller than alpha one, alpha prime, because you can easily find an, or, uh, functions where this one is bounded, but this one is not unbounded. Okay, so uh, that means that the norms are not equivalent. Okay, uh, now that's in function space or in image space. And of course, we want to do exactly the same thing for the data spaces we look at. And in data space, as usual, everything is with respect to the second variable. So we declare the uh, H alpha space of that cylinder that we always have for the radon transform as the, uh, um, the um, space of all fu data functions G for which uh, the H alpha norm of G um, is smaller than infinity and uh, the H alpha norm of a data function is declared just as above. So it's uh, with respect to the second variable. So it's G hat of theta and sigma, one plus sigma squared to the alpha. And uh, of course, then everything um, integrated over all directions. Okay, so uh, that somehow makes sense. And again, just to note that if alpha is integer, we get the normal norms back almost up to some constants, but at least the, the norms defined are equivalent and that's the main thing. Uh, in the following, I will always restrict myself to compactly supported functions. And uh, without loss of generality, I will assume that the support is in K1 and 0. It doesn't play a role, but well. Okay, the main theorem uh, that I want to prove is that um, for uh, that uh, there are constants C1 and C2 such that uh, the norm of RF, so the norm of, our, of the data function in the space H n minus one over two is bounded by to uh, above by C2 times the norm of uh, the L2 norm of F and bounded to below by C1 times the L2 norm of F. So it can be, so it's always bounded between these two over here. And uh, what we need for that is obviously that F is in L2 of omega, omega K1 of zero. And uh, we assume that it's compactly supported inside of omega and uh, you might think of F being continuous. And uh, so that would be a dense set in L2 of omega. Okay, so um, before I prove it, let me interpret that because it's um, really an important thing. Um, let's assume that F is just in L2. Then we have that Rf is in H n minus one over two. So it's n minus one over two times differentiable. For n equals two, well, that's a little bit fishy. It's one half differentiable. But uh, let's take uh, n equals three. That means that this is then now weakly differentiable. So if f is just in L2, then Rf is weakly differentiable. And even for n equals two, it's a little bit more smoother. So generally, this, this says that Rf is smoother than f, which is nice if you want to compute R, but it, which is bad if you want to do the inversion. So in a way, R is an integrating uh, operator, right? And um, because, um, I mean, think of normal integration, then what you get out is differentiable and uh, same thing here. 
Okay, um, so that's the first thing. Second thing, um, now um, we, let's take uh, g equal to rf and f and l2 function. So that means f is r to the minus 1g because uh, r is, is invertible on its range. Okay, um, so uh, first of all, it makes sense to compute the hn minus 1 over 2 norm of g because uh, since f is in L2, well, this one is obvi obviously def um, the um, hn minus 1 over 2 norm in is uh, bound of g is bounded. So uh, this is in the correct space, and this one is a real number, and that's okay. Okay, uh, now plugging that in, I mean, dividing this by C2, we get that 1 over C2 times the norm of G measured in the space Hn minus 1 over 2 is smaller or equal to R to the minus 1 G in L2, just plugging everything in over here, and then dividing this relation by 1 over C1, we get that this is smaller uh, or equal to 1 over C1, the norm of G, again in Hn minus 1 over now, first thing is, if that is true, then from the second inequality, we have that r to the minus 1 is continuous if we take the source space as hn minus 1 over 2. So uh, this is now continuous. And so that means that if we add the n minus 1 over 2 derivative to our norm, um, then we get a continuous operator. And that's exactly what we defined as ill postness of order n minus 1 over 2 when we, uh, when we started the lecture. That was one of the first definitions we had. Okay, so that means that at most the radon transform is improperly post, ill post of the order n minus 1 over 2. And uh, the question is, can we do any better? No, we can't, because uh, this is also bounded through to below by the same norm. Um, so um, since the norms are not equivalent, uh, we cannot go to, um, to an order smaller than n minus 1 over 2. So that means that the ill postness of the radon transform is exactly n minus 1 over 2. OK. so. Uh, that sounds good. And um, I want to remind you, um, let me first tell you, of course, we, we're always looking at the case n equals 2. So we're in, in, uh, interested in the two-dimensional case. So in R2, we get uh, an ill postness of 1 half, which is better than the ill postness of the first derivative, which is 1. So it's in a way simpler to invert the radon transform than to take the derivative of a function. And that means that uh, the inversion of the radon transform is a very, very mildly ill post problem. And uh, that's the reason why we have so excellent image in, uh, images in computerized tomography. And uh, yeah, I will prove, I think I will stop here and prove everything in the next video.